Well, good evening. It is truly marvelous to be back here after two years in person with all of you in this grand ballroom as we celebrate 30 years of the work and mission of Massachusetts Family Institute. And what a wonderful way to celebrate with Dr. Arn and his message to us tonight. I've had the honor of serving as MFI's president for eight of those past 30 years. And as you've just heard, MFI has addressed an increasing number of issues since it began in 1991. We have fought to stop the redefinition of marriage and now work to preserve the definition of male and female, the lives of the unborn, and to resist the pressure to embrace suicide for the sick and the elderly. While we have won some battles and lost others, we have remained steadfast and grown our organization so that today MFI is a full-throated public defense of faith, family, and freedom itself, and the go-to organization in the Commonwealth for our shared values. Indeed, here in the Bay State, we are facing new and unique threats to our faith, our families, and our freedom. As a result, people are increasingly turning to MFI as there are often no other institutions willing or able to help them. MFI's mission as it enters its fourth decade of ministry is not only spearheading big statewide faith, uh, fights on legislation, although we continue to do that too, but providing critical help in individual crises, often quietly and behind the scenes, in cases that can quickly escalate into a precedent that has implications for us all. For example, in May of this year, city bureaucrats in New Bedford continued to use a heavy hand with COVID restrictions on local churches, treating them much worse than, say, restaurants. Sitting only with your immediate household, socially distanced, and facing front in church, you had to remain masked for the whole service. But after the service, you could walk across the street, sit down at a table with perfect strangers, face to face, passing around a bowl of chips and salsa without wearing a mask at all. So we worked with a local church to file suit against these discriminatory restrictions at, at both the municipal and the statewide level. And two days before the government's written response was due in court, these indoor gathering restrictions were abruptly changed from requirements to optional guidelines for the entire Commonwealth. We also held local bureaucrats accountable when they barged into a Sunday morning service in Medford in response to someone calling City Hall, I didn't know they were open on Sundays, but uh, gravely concerned because they saw so many cars in the church parking lot on Sunday morning. And this is a church that is literally a stone's throw away from the Medford City Hall. They tried to cancel this church's service because someone was triggered by too many cars in a parking lot. Now, in response to the eruption of cancel culture this past spring, we launched the first ever MFI book club, where hundreds of you joined us online to discuss Rod Dreher's prescient book, Live Not By Lies. We built a virtual safe space to discuss many of the issues surrounding cancel culture and to hear from emigres to our country how what we are experiencing now and here in America is ominously familiar to the socialist and communist totalitarianism these emigres fled decades ago. And this coming spring, we're going to do it again, this time with a book that has already been canceled, Ryan T. Anderson's When Harry Became Sally, Responding to the Transgender Moment. Though this book was published three years ago, its thesis that men cannot, in fact, become women and vice versa has already been moved outside of acceptable public opinion. And so Amazon canceled it in February. Well, we're going to do our part to increase its sales by reading it and talking about it. And I just got an email response this afternoon back from the author. He's going to join us as well via Zoom to discuss it. Because we must clearly identify the lies we are facing and build a culture of truthful resistance. And the MFI Band Book Club is another small step towards that end. Now, although cancel culture may be a new term, it's not a new phenomenon. Here in this ballroom tonight, we have a doctor who was forced out of a hospital for speaking inconvenient truths about the health risks of homosexual activity. We've had foster parents squeezed out of the DCF system because they were deemed too Christian, and people threatened with losing their jobs or their own business unless they call men she and her and women he and him. Now, it's been clear for some time that the elites who govern us 
believe that the right to religious freedom and conscientious objection must always be subordinated to rights of sexual expression. We have anticipated that people of faith would be canceled, lose professional licensure, media access, bank access, even their jobs for resisting the LGBT agenda. Over the last year, however, we saw this process accelerated with a sweeping adoption of critical race theory, which it is apparently an unforgivable sin even to question. And we have a public, public high school principal with us tonight who was recently fired for do doing just that. Now, as if that weren't enough to make your head spin, we now face a nascent biomedical security state that has fast forwarded things beyond what we could ever have anticipated. Now, look, you can say what you want about the COVID vaccines, and I mean that literally here. No one's going to cancel you, deplatform you, kick you out of the ballroom, have your professional license revoked, or fire you from your job tonight for speaking your mind about a vaccine. And the reason you're clapping is because the way in which the vaccines are being forced on people, frequently over medical or religious objections, or fundamental concerns of maintaining individual freedom or bodily integrity, has become nothing short of draconian. For example, there's a family here tonight whose healthy 16-year-old son is barred from all school sports and extracurricular activities because he would not submit to the vaccine. And another family whose 14-year-old daughter has been kicked out of school altogether because she wouldn't get it. There's a nurse sitting amongst you right now with over 20 years of experience at a major Boston hospital who will lose his job if he doesn't get the shot. And I just spoke two days ago with a state trooper who will lose his soon for the same reason. At MFI, we've been absolutely flooded with calls for help in navigating these various vaccine mandates because people are facing getting kicked out of school or losing their livelihood if they don't get a religious exemption approved. Now, as a result of the increased demand, we've had to build, to build capacity in our own organization. I'm an attorney myself, but as I say often, I'm also chief cook and bottle washer. So I'm happy to say that thanks to the support of you, our generous donors, we were able to hire an experienced part-time staff attorney to help address these new challenges. If you're one of the many who have sought information from us on this issue, you've probably talked or emailed with Vanessa Pompey. And she's sitting right over there if she would stand for us. Thank you, Vanessa. So bringing Vanessa on board has allowed us to help more people and to do it more quickly. And things are moving quickly these days. Several weeks ago, MFI hosted a Zoom webinar on the issue of religious exemptions, and over 100 Massachusetts pastors logged on. One of those recently told us that five nurses in her church all had their religious exemption requests approved and credited our work in helping them. But this is an unprecedented health crisis, some will argue. Should MFI be involved in that? That's a fair question. And so we looked at not only the profound implications for religious liberties, and parental rights that these vaccine mandates touch upon, and frankly, the cavalier, if not downright vindictive way that pandemic regulations were used against churches. But we also recognize that this is not the first health crisis that MFI has tried to bring common sense and truth to. For 30 years, MFI has been sounding the alarm about the very real and evidence-based, scientifically unquestioned health crisis caused by sexual promiscuity amongst our youth. To put this in perspective, high school students in Massachusetts right now are 20 times more likely to become infected with an STI than they are to be hospitalized with COVID. What's been the response? A statewide campaign to curb premarital sexual relationships and to, promote, and to promote abstinence amongst our youth? Is social media suspending the accounts of people who are anti-abstinence or STI deniers? No. Local boards of health did not demand that anyone lock their children in their homes or exercise any restraint whatsoever. As we've been showing for decades, the people who want you to just Zoom church are the very same health experts who are indoctrinating your children into all manner of sexual promiscuity and making them affirm the bizarre and dangerous lie that boys can become girls and vice versa, often as early as kindergarten. And I'm working with a family right now in Western Mass whose 11 year old daughter in response to this kind of relentless propaganda told her school guidance counselor that she thought she might be trans. 
What did the counselor do? Pick up the phone and call the parents to discuss this development? No. She immediately marched the girl down to the school library and turned her over to be mentored by the middle school's gender queer, her term, not mine, gender queer librarian, a middle-aged woman who routinely presents like a more colorful version of Pee Wee Herman. So when people ask me how my year has been, I tell them it's all vaccines and drag queens. <laughs> Now, that's not entirely true, of course. There are other issues. Thank goodness. Right now, we're in the midst of a statewide referendum campaign to stop legalized infanticide in Massachusetts. Just a few days after Christmas, last December, the Massachusetts legislature used their pro-abortion supermajority to repeal protections for children accidentally born alive during an abortion. Abortion is now legal in Massachusetts up to and apparently through birth. There's no reverse in this insanity on Beacon Hill anytime soon. So we look to the only recourse we have left. Let the people vote. The first step in this process is to collect over 80,000 signatures of registered voters. Now, as you heard during the video, we've done that before. We can do it again. So if you haven't signed on already, we will have volunteers with clipboards and pro-life campaign t-shirts right outside in that back corner when you leave tonight. Please support this effort. Another example of finding ways to resist when virtually everyone in authority is against you is what we've been doing in Worcester. As Mike mentioned in the awards presentation, for the past two years, hundreds of parents have bravely and diligently stood up to a hostile school board and city administration under the sway of Planned Parenthood, telling them they do not want a pornographic, anti-family sex ed program. But they were ignored, and the school adopted a spectacularly awful curriculum. I guess the parents are supposed to be grateful that none of them were designated domestic terrorists by the FBI. Now, over time, with a lot of hard work, it is possible to bring the school board back to sanity through electing better members. And I hope we do that with Chanel as step one. But we must realize by now that focusing exclusively on elections is a losing strategy. We must realize that there are indeed many political battles we should and must fight, but we need also to rebuild the walls of our own culture. What do I mean by that? Well, there was a time when parents, even here in Massachusetts, simply would not have stood for a school explaining the finer points of sodomy to their 12-year-old children. If discovered, a teacher who did so would be promptly fired, or worse. Today, educators brag about it on social media, and parents are either ignorant of it, embrace it, or quietly resign themselves in acquiescence to it. But not in Worcester. Thanks to the work of parents like Chanel Soucy, we have, again, over 600 children spared from this instruction in deviant erotica through their statutory right to opt out of sex ed classes. The parents may have failed so far in their fight to keep Planned Parenthood out of the schools, but they're building a culture of resistance one family at a time. And they even have their own t-shirts and lawn signs. Kudos to them. Now, this widespread opt-out movement is something we have not seen before, as Mike mentioned. And by law in Massachusetts, the school is required to provide an alternative class to those students who are opted out. So what happens when so many students are removed from the sex ed class that it becomes an administrative and logistical nightmare for the school? Hopefully, we're about to find out in Worcester. And who knows what this newly formed network of parents will be capable of down the line as they build cultural muscle. It is a time to build and to build boldly. And we can build because we've done it before. 30 years ago, MFI was launched. In the more recent years, MFI's own board members have been instrumental in opening schools, founding colleges, and planting churches. Amidst the incessant clamor about identity, we need to embrace our own. Now, Dr. Arn didn't mention, but it's important to note that when many colleges, even Christian ones, seemed embarrassed by their religious heritage, Hillsdale has just completed building a gorgeous new stone chapel and is doubling down on their faith identity. In the face of a nationwide assault on our history, a rewriting of our founding, Dr. Arndt stepped into the chaos to lead the 1776 report, countering lies with truth. And he can do that because he leads an organization that has made itself uncancelable. They made a deliberate choice years ago to not be financially dependent on government funding because they knew the strings that would come with it. More importantly, they know who they are and what they stand for. And this allows them to develop a strong, coherent culture 
able to act and not simply to react. Now think of the colleges you went to or where some of your children are now. How many of them would have erupted in student or faculty-led protests, maybe even riots, if their president authored a report daring to question the New York Times 1619 project? Are you still sending those schools money? Worse yet, are you still sending them your children? Now is the time to concentrate our resources in the institutions we can trust and build new institutions to replace the ones we can't. Now, as good as the 1776 report is and the curriculum that Hillsdale has designed around it, how many public schools in Massachusetts will use it? We need more schools that are willing and able to provide a real alternative to the state system for our children. And we need to make them more affordable for a broader swath of families. To that end, MFI has worked this year with churches all throughout the Commonwealth to start launching small church-based schools and learning cooperatives to build capacity for people of faith to educate our own. Now, I've been thinking a lot about the book of Nehemiah, a time for the people of God to build, a chance to restore some of what was lost. But it had to be done with a shovel in one hand and a sword in the other. Granted favor by the emperor, Nehemiah was nevertheless threatened and harassed by petty and corrupt bureaucrats of the Persian deep state. But he led the people in building a wall. A wall defines a city, a polis. That's my Greek word for anyway. And we need to keep that imagery in mind as we do something similar. To fight the political and legal battles we must, to keep ourselves free, and to build. Build, rebuild, reinforce a whole city's worth of culture parallel to, but set apart from, the godless culture of death that dominates our commonwealth now. Author Rod Dreher references the term parallel polis to describe how Christians and other dissidents survived under communism in Poland. MFI is here to be a hub of resources, an ombudsman for that parallel polis, pursuing truth. And thanks to your generous donations, I don't have to worry about getting canceled for speaking the truth. I can still say publicly, I can still say publicly that marriage is between one man and one woman. Bruce Jenner is still and will always be a man. The life begins at conception and abortion is the murder of the unborn. And because I have that freedom, I have an obligation to use it. We each have an obligation to use the freedom we still have. And that's important because I can't do it alone. We can't evangelize the culture around us or even transmit it to our own children if we allow ourselves to be silenced or intimidated. And a large part of what drives me to do the work that I do at MFI is that I have always been blessed with a strong and supportive family. But families need churches, churches, and children need schools, and parents need at least one means of income to be able to raise and support the next generation. That's why at MFI we educate and equip parents to take control of their children's education. We work with employees and business owners on how to respond to demands that they affirm biological men as trans women and vice versa, without denying God's creation of mankind in his image. We help churches keep their doors open for worship and ministry. You shouldn't need an organization like MFI in order to do these things, but in Massachusetts you do. And for the past 30 years we've been here, standing in the gap and speaking truth, serving as a voice and an advocate for you and your family. Sometimes it feels a bit like a voice crying in the wilderness, true, but we're not necessarily trying to convince the world at large. There are many who refuse to hear it. Our audience is more often those who need reminder, encouragement, clarification. For those who are willing to hear, we will help them find their voice and build a chorus that will not quietly go into the darkness of night. We will work and be vigilant through the night as the men under Nehemiah were to build anew for our children and their children. We will stand beside you in this work, and you make it possible with your generous donations. If you value a culture where life is cherished, families thrive, and religious freedom flourishes, MFI is a sound investment. In fact, if you're interested in helping and protecting our churches, parents, religious schools, and children, MFI is in a growth industry. I can say with confidence at this point that no one knows what 2022 will bring, or even what new challenges may erupt a month from now. 
But the team at MFI will be there, dedicated, professional, capable, adaptable, uncancelable, helping you build for the future. This brings us to the most important time of our evening, when each of us has the opportunity to put our convictions and faith into action through a gift or pledge to financially support the mission of MFI. Table captains, at this time, would you please distribute the response cards and pens to your table. Tonight's event has been underwritten by our sponsors and your ticket purchases. So 100% of your gift or pledge will go directly into the culture changing work of MFI. I've spoken to you this evening about the powerful cultural and political forces arrayed against us in our defense of faith, family, and freedom. And admittedly, they often possess a tremendous advantage in power and influence, especially in Massachusetts. But I think it's helpful to understand that much of that is fueled by a massive financial disparity. For example, MFI's annual budget last year was about $650,000. And we thank you for that. We're grateful for the sacrificial generosity that makes that possible. But to put that in perspective, Planned Parenthood and the forces promoting a culture of death from infanticide to euthanasia, as well as seeking to sexualize our children in the public schools, spend over $2 million a year on activism in Massachusetts alone. The ACLU and other groups working to banish Christianity from the public square spend over $7 million. And the reason parental rights and religious freedoms are having to backpedal in the face of a new sexual orthodoxy is because groups pushing the LGBTQIA2 Spirit Plus, that's the official one, uh, agenda are able to pour nearly $14 million a year into our commonwealth to advance their goals. That means MFI is holding the line against a horde of activists with over $20 million a year at their disposal in Massachusetts. We call that income inequality. But by God's grace, we are able to do a lot with a little. Will you help us do more? Will you help us build for the future? Because it is your faithful support that makes the good work of MFI possible. Please join me as we take a moment now to prayerfully consider supporting the work and mission of MFI and fill out our pledge cards. Thank you for giving us the privilege of serving the families of Massachusetts. God bless you, God save the Commonwealth, and God bless America. 